Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Reviewing Research Involving Medical Devices. We're excited to be discussing this topic with you today. On that note, if you'd like to stay informed on quorum initiatives such as our webinars, be sure to sign up for our mailing list. You can find the mail list by going to our website, www.quorumreview.com, and clicking on the blue Join button within the Join Our Mailing List stripe in the middle of the home page. This will ensure that you receive the latest e-news updates from Quorum, including Quorum's responses to FDA guidance, trends in clinical trial review, and our quarterly e-news publication, the Quorum Forum. I'll be giving you a brief overview of Quorum before I introduce our presenter, but first off, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. The webinar slide deck and recording will be posted to, on our website within five business days. We'll be emailing you a link to view the recording as soon as it's available. Feel free to share the link with your staff and or colleagues. We will be emailing a certificate of attendance within one week. We dispatch these only to the email addresses that signed up for and attended the webinar. And now about Quorum. I'd like to take a few moments before we get started to talk briefly about Quorum Review. Quorum Review is fully accredited with the Association for Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, or AHARP, through 2019. Quorum is compliant with both FDA and OHARP requirements. We have an internal regulatory group of 30 people providing industry-leading guidance, and our in-house attorneys can frequently be found speaking at industry events providing thought leadership. Quorum has boards that are appropriately comprised to review studies in the United States, Canada, as well as internationally. Currently, Quorum is one of the largest central IRBs with over 200 employees, and of those that are, are of equivalent size, it is the only one that remains independent of venture capital ownership. Quorum's turnaround times are among the best in the industry. Quorum holds 15 convened board meetings each week. We have a meeting every day dedicated to the review of new protocols and two board meetings each week where we review North American studies. We have one meeting each week that has depth in oncology expertise, and if you'd prefer your oncology studies be reviewed there, that's always an option. Additionally, we have staff of reviewers who are continuously reviewing expeditable items during business hours. The number of meetings we offer enables us to provide 24-hour turnaround of site documents from the receipt of a completed submission to posting approval documents on the portal, 36-hour review cycle for amendments and same-day site changes. To streamline site submissions, Quorum offers one-time submittal of the CV and audit documentation, thus preventing redundant submissions. Among Quorum's founding principles was the customer experience, and to support that experience, today we have staff available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time to answer questions. Each study with Quorum, regardless of size, will receive its own study manager. And again, I'd like to plug our legal team. I think it's worth mentioning, again, because we, many central IRBs utilize outside counsel, and the fact that Quorum doesn't means many things for you. We have a regulatory attorney available for every board meeting to help navigate the complex laws and regulations. Attorneys help with our consent form development, and our attorneys help answer questions regarding study and consent form design. Finally, it's because of Quorum's investment in our regulatory staff that we're able to hold these free webinars that help the research community at large. Additionally, Quorum offers a secure portal where you can find all of your approval documents. You'll also find many different kinds of status reports so you can quickly assess where your study or site is within the process as well as access our Smart Form Site Information Questionnaire. Quorum is aware that there are special needs for Phase 1 and research which qualifies for expedited review. We have special teams and processes for these kinds of studies. We do work with hospitals and institutions and are able to support their unique needs. To date, we've signed working agreements with over 1,000 institutions and academic research centers, and that number does not count the institutions that work with us but don't require a signed agreement. Additionally, Quorum has a staff of institution specialists whose primary function it is to assist universities and hospitals through the process of utilizing a central IRB when appropriate. This model has been very successful at getting a larger percentage of overall study sites than sponsor or CROs ever originally thought. We're aware that quality is supremely important for our customers and we perform a 100% quality check on all documents. Finally, we wanted to make everyone aware of Quorum's commitment to efficiency. Quorum employs a number of black belts and other Six Sigma qualified personnel whose sole job is to continually evaluate our processes to eliminate steps that don't add value, giving our customer a less complicated process with less steps and less opportunities for error. I'd also like to mention for those of you who are interested in receiving additional certification credit, Quorum Review, Boston University, and the Massachusetts Society for Medical Research will be hosting a live conference on October 24th at the Cambridge, Massachusetts Marriott on the topic of big data and biorepositories. We will also be streaming the conference by webcast. There's a small registration fee to attend, either live or virtually, 
but you can learn more by clicking on the link on the Quorum Review homepage, or you can email us at clientrelations at quorumreview.com. And now I'd like to introduce today's expert presenter, Mitchell Parrish. Mitchell Parrish joined Quorum Review IRB in January of 2010 as a regulatory attorney. Prior to Quorum, Mr. Parrish worked as a regulatory counsel for Western IRB and as a regulatory advisor to the National Cancer Institute. Mr. Parrish earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Oregon School of Law and is a member of the Washington State Bar and Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. Additionally, Mr. Parrish has his Regulatory Affairs Certification and is a Certified IRB Professional. And now I'm going to transition the slides over to Mitchell. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ari. Appreciate it. To everyone listening in today, good day. For the next approximately one hour, I'm going to be covering the topic, Reviewing Medical Device Research. Now, how I've organized this presentation is into three distinct parts. The first part, I'm going to discuss U.S. and Canadian authorities and definitions of medical devices. Then part two, this will be the bulk of our presentation today. And I'm going to discuss IRB review of medical devices, hence the name of this presentation today. And that section is going to be organized into discussing ethical principles, regulatory requirements, and appropriate documentation for medical devices used in research. And then part three, we'll discuss briefly some special considerations. I'll talk about combination products, humanitarian use devices, in vitro diagnostics, companion diagnostics, and finally, adaptive clinical trials. And I'll wrap up those three parts with a brief summary. So with that said, let's get started. First, part one, authorities in the U.S. and Canada. Now, I want to point out to everyone listening in that we are discussing U.S. and Canada today. Now you'll see there's a U.S. flag and there's a Canadian flag. There's a very specific purpose for this. If at any time during this presentation you think you're lost or, oh my gosh, what's Mitchell talking about right now? Is he talking about U.S. or Canada? Do not worry. In the upper right-hand corner of every slide, you will see a U.S. flag when I'm talking about concepts that apply just to the U.S. You will see a Canadian flag when I'm talking about concepts that apply just to Canada. And you will see a U.S. and Canadian flag when I'm talking about things that apply to both the U.S. and Canada. So first, those authorities in the U.S. Now, the definition of a medical device helps us decide which authorities are involved. So for the FDA, that means if the FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health is involved, otherwise known as CEDAR, or if the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research is involved, otherwise known as CBER. So CEDAR is involved as the main body for governing regulated medical devices. CBER also oversees medical devices, but those medical devices related to blood and cellular products. So, for example, this would be machines or software assays that help screen blood for, let's say, various STDs like HIV. And we know these two agencies are involved if there is research involving a medical device. And just so we're all on the same page, it's usually clear whether or not there's a medical device involved in a study as opposed to something else, like a drug or a biologic. But let's take a look at that definition so we're all on the same page. The definition of a medical device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar related article, including any component, part, or accessory which is intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions, or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, or this next part's important, intended to affect the structure or any function of the body and does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action with the body and which is not dependent upon being metabolized for the achievement of its primary intended purpose. Now that last bullet's important because that's where the FDA really tries to distinguish a medical device from a drug. You'll see that when we look at Canada, they don't have the specific language distinguishing drug from device, but this can be very important when there does become a nuanced product where it's a little unclear what the product is, if it's a device or a drug. So we know the definition of medical device, we know we have CEDAR involved, or we could have CBER involved. So what are those actual regulations that are involved that govern review of medical device research? Well, we have 21 CFR 807. This talks about establishment of registration and device listing for manufacturers, but for our purposes today, what you're going to be noted is specifically subpart E. We're going to be talking about the pre-market notification procedure, otherwise known as 510K. We're also going to be discussing 21 CFR 812, investigational device exemptions, otherwise known as IDE. We're going to discuss 21 CFR 814, pre-market approval of devices, and specifically pre-market approval applications, PMA. 
and Humanitarian Use Devices, HUD. Of course, we also have the medical device classifications, and we have 21 CFR 50 and 21 CFR 56 specifically applying to IRBs regarding the protection of human subjects and institutional review boards. So this isn't an exhaustive list of those regulations applying to medical device research, but these are the citations that you have, uh, that I wanted to point out to you because these are the, one, the ones that I'm going to be discussing throughout this presentation today. So in addition to the FDA, we also obviously have the Office for Human Research Protections Regulations. This is the pivotal document governing human subject research that applies if there's a federal agency involved or federal funding, and that's protection of human subjects. And finally, we have the International Organization for Standardization, otherwise known as ISO. You may hear this, not many people do, but there's a document called ISO 14155. This document actually discusses standards for clinical investigation medical devices for human subjects. A lot of people are very, very familiar with the International Committee on Harmonization Good Clinical Practices, otherwise known as ICHGCP. So this is essentially the equivalent of ICHGCP, but for medical device studies, because again, ICHGCP only applies to those drug studies. So here's sort of that list, again, not comprehensive, but for our purposes today, I really want you to understand and know the backbone behind what I'm discussing, because if there's ever a question, it's very empowering to, to know the agency that's involved, if you ever have questions that you need to ask them, and it's also very empowering to know the actual regulations. So if there's ever a question, you can actually go seek out the FDA regulation or seek out that ISO standard or the OHARP regulation to decide for yourself and to have yourself answer your own question with knowing these regulations. Now, moving on to authorities in Canada, here we have the Health Canada Therapeutic Products Directorate, Medical Devices Bureau. So this is going to be your main authority governing medical devices in Canada. And to cover the actual device, the actual definition of a medical device in Canada, this is any article, instrument, apparatus, or contrivance, including any component, part of accessory thereof, manufactured, sold, or represented for use in the diagnosis, treatment, mitigation, or prevention of a disease, disorder, or abnormal physical state, or its symptoms, or restoring, correcting, or modifying a body function, or the body structure of human beings or animals, or the diagnosis of pregnancy, or care during pregnancy and after birth. So here, a little bit different than the U.S. definition, kind of getting at the same idea, distinguishing it from a drug or something else, but also Canada does something a bit different and adds in, talks about pregnancy and also after birth. So in Canada, we know the definition of medical device, and we know that it's mainly going to be the Medical Devices Bureau that's going to be the authority in Canada on medical devices. And in terms of those regulations in Canada that are going to be applicable to what we're discussing today, we have the Medical Device Regulations, SOR 98-282, specifically Part 3, Medical Devices for Investigational Testing Involving Human Subjects, and also, importantly in Canada, Schedule 1. These are the actual classification rules for medical devices. There's four classification rules that help us decide what class of a device is being used in a clinical study in Canada. In addition to these Health Canada regulations, we have three institutions that put out its own policy statement. These are the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, better wise known as the Tri-Council. So these three agents put out a very pivotal document in Canada called the Tri-Council Policy Statement. And we are on the second edition of that document, so the abbreviation is the TCPS2. I like to think of this document as sort of equivalent to the U.S. Regulation 45 CFR 46, because it's really the most detailed document governing human subject research in Canada, and therefore governing human subject research involving medical devices in Canada. And just as in the U.S., you could have, and should really consider the International Organization for Standardization, again, that ISO document 14155. Again, this is the sort of equivalent of medical devices as ICHGCP is to drugs. So again, understand that these are the bulk of what we're going to be talking today and know that it's empowering to understand what I'm talking about and where the information actually comes from. So if you ever have a question or a question about something I said, you can actually go to the regulation or go to the tri Council Policy Statement and take a look for yourself and have that clarified in your mind. So those are the authorities. We know what the definition of medical device in the U.S. is. We know what it is in Canada. We know the agencies involved. We know the regulations that are going to be involved. So let's get into the bulk of the presentation, part two, and really dig down and discuss IRB review of medical devices. 
Now, I've organized this second section into three parts. So no matter what the device, the IRB will always have to ensure its review addresses three things. First, I'm going to talk about the ethical principles that the IRB should review and address, the regulatory requirements, and the appropriate documentation that the IRB should be reviewing for the device. So first, those ethical principles. Now here I have a US and Canadian flag up. This is the Belmont Report. It's a US-based document but really it applies to the U.S. and Canada. It really lays out those three ethical principles that when you're reviewing medical device research, you should always be considering. And that first ethical principle is respect for persons. In other words, you need to respect people by making sure they have appropriate information so that they are autonomous and can make their own decision about whether to participate in research. And you also need to protect vulnerable populations. So this is an ethical principle that would apply to all research, not just medical device research. Now, how this ethical principle is usually captured would be through the informed consent process. The next ethical principle is beneficence. Here, this means you need to maximize benefits and minimize harms. How this is typically captured in reviewing medical device research is to really consider the risk to benefit ratio, and you need to make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks. And finally, you have the justice principle where you need to make sure with medical device research that you're ensuring the equal distribution of the burdens and benefits. How you can make sure this is being captured when reviewing medical device research is by really considering the selection of subjects. How is the specific population that's going to be in the research selected? Is there actual scientific rationale or other rationale for it? In other words, is it a population that shouldn't be targeted or is there some other population that should be included in the research but is not? So selection of subjects is really going to address that justice principle. In addition to the Belmont Report, we also have the Declaration of Helsinki. I think this document is quite well known. It does outline a lot of ethical principles to consider when reviewing research, specifically medical device research. And so while there's new more principles, I'm just going to focus on one, and that's General Principle 7, which presents the overarching theme of the document. It states, medical research is subject to ethical standards that promote and ensure respect for all human subjects and protect their health and rights. The reason why I want to point out this principle is, of course, we have those three principles from the Belmont Report which are also sort of echoed in Canada through the Tri-Council Policy Statement. But here this is an overarching statement. So remember, it's always going to be important in no matter what research you're reviewing, including medical device research, to generally consider the ethics of the research to determine if it's appropriate to approve. Now with those ethical principles in mind, let's consider a few, a few unique ethical considerations specifically related to medical device research. So the first unique ethical, cons ethical consideration are sham surgeries. So a problem with device studies, just like with drug studies, is that there certainly can be a placebo effect. And in fact, with device studies, it has been said that the placebo effect in device study could account for up to 35% of the response. Now, specifically with devices that have to be implanted or involve surgery, people think the placebo effect may largely come from people just being uh, feeling comfortable with the surgeon and thinking since the surgeon's going in, I'm going to be feeling better when I come out of the surgery and have this device. So having that 35% factor can really skew whether or not research has actually produced results that show efficacy or if it's really not that efficacious but really there was a placebo effect. So just like with drug studies, of course it's going to be important to design clinical trials using a control arm. But with devices, this could be a sham surgery arm as opposed to a placebo arm. So here's the sham surgery dilemma from an ethical perspective. So if a sham surgery is involved, this means people are going to be having essentially a fake surgery, a surgery that they're made to think they had something done to them, but really they didn't. So a sham surgery involves no benefit and may carry risks. So how do we rectify this with the Belmont Report, which we just discussed, that talks about doing no harm? Also, how do we rectify this with the Declaration of Helsinki, which talks about why the primary purpose of medical research is to generate new knowledge, this goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. So this would seem to go in the face of a sham surgery, would seem to go in the face of these principles. Well, let's explore this with an example and see how you actually could review and possibly approve research involving a sham surgery arm. So the example I'm going to use is a device, a blood pressure device for renal denervation. So renal denervation is a minimally invasive endovascular catheter-based procedure using radiofrequency ablation aimed at treating resistant hypertension. 
aka high blood pressure. By applying radiofrequency pulses to the renal arteries, the nerves in the vascular wall can be denuded of nerve endings. This causes reduction of renal, sympathetic, afferent, and efferent activity, and blood pressure can be decreased. That seems like a lot to swallow. Here's my simplified version of what renal denervation is. You make an incision in the leg through a catheter. You have the device go up to the renal artery, and you zap the renal artery with, electronic, with electric energy to lower the blood pressure. So just think of it as zapping the renal artery for our purposes. So if you have a study testing a renal denervation device, you may have a group one that goes through the actual procedure where they're in the operating room, there's an incision made, the catheter is inserted, the renal artery is zapped. Then you may have a group two. This group goes through the sham procedure only. So the person goes into the operating room, they go under anesthesia, there's a small incision made in their leg, sewed back up, and they're on their way, but they never actually have the device tested in them. So since you have a sham surgery, along with a sham surgery, you of course could have bleeding, you could have infection, there could be antibiotic treatment to prevent infection, and the risks of anesthesia. So you're going through a lot of risks with no potential benefit because the device is not actually being used to zap the renal artery on group two. So again, do no harm. It certainly seems like they're harming and putting science ahead of the individual. It seems like they're doing this. So if I all, if I had everyone listening in today in the room, I'd probably ask you, okay, do you think this actually upholds the ethical principles? A lot of you may say no, but then let me pose additional information. Let's say, what if you knew in Europe there are currently renal denervation devices just like the one in this study being used now quite frequently? What I've also told you in Europe, they're finding that renal denervation devices actually may not be very effective at all. So they're subjecting thousands of people to the use of this device and through all the risks of the procedure without any possible efficacy. What if I also told you that the FDA often may require a sham surgery arm? So you really have to think, if you have a study with a sham surgery arm and you're making sure the risks are minimized and the benefits are maximized as much as possible, yeah, you have to consider do no harm, but if you really look at what the Belmont report says, it's do no harm in the context of really considering the risk to benefit ratio. So if you know people are consenting, you know they're informed, you minimize those risks, there's potential benefit to one group and you do everything to minimize the risks and inform people in the group that's not receiving and you know that in general this could help develop a product that's actually efficacious and not just develop a product that seems to be efficacious, but actually once it goes out to the population is not tested on all sorts of people, it's not efficacious, then it seems like the pendulum swings and you could actually approve this study. So definitely an ethical debate, sham surgeries, but really have to consider the whole picture to determine whether or not it's appropriate to approve a study with that sham surgery arm. Another unique ethical consideration is with devices very different from a drug where you could be giving a drug, then person's going to go off the active drug, drug is a half-life, it's going to be out of the person's system. Of course, there could be effects in the future, but that's very different from having an implanted device in someone that could be there for long term. So if you do have a device trial where there is an implanted device or a long term device, as an additional consideration that's not required in the regulations, but you should think of from an ethical standpoint, the IRB should consider what ongoing monitoring and care is actually going to be provided to the participant that receives the device, and what training on the device is actually provided to the participant, and almost more important, to the participant's family or caregiver. To highlight this concept, I want to talk about the example of a ventricular assist device. So you could have what's known as a left ventricular assist device or a right ventricular assist device or a biventricular assist device. That's the picture you're seeing on your screen. So what this is, it's a device that's implanted and it actually pumps the heart and it's connected to an external battery power. Now people that have this device, this left ventricular assist device for example, if the device stops working, the person dies because their heart fails. So this machine is what is keeping the heart moving. This is a complicated device. And in the research study, you can't simply just insert this device, have the battery pack, and send the person home. You need to really educate the participant about the device they have. You need to know, and they need to know, how the battery source works, what the warning lights or the warning sounds are for if the battery source is getting low, and they need to know who to contact if something happens. And then let's say if that participant may pass out at home. 
there needs to be family or a caregiver that also understands how to use the device and those warnings and who to call for that device. So that's an ethical consideration for implanted devices. The IRB should really, and researchers should really think, how are they going to inform participants appropriately so they can minimize any risks to people that have that implanted or long-term device. Other considerations for ongoing care and removal of devices, what is the associated cost of the device, and who pays for the device servicing, modifications, replacement, if it comes to that. Also, what happens in the case the device must be removed? Who pays for that procedure? It's going to be really important to lay out those costs up front to the participant as is required, and I think it's going to be important from an ethics standpoint to make sure they're fully informed about what they're getting into, especially related to those costs and potential care in the future. So those are the ethical principles. We have respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. So always keep those in mind when reviewing medical device research. Now in terms of the specific regulatory requirements for reviewing research, first we have the U.S. regulatory requirements. If these requirements look familiar to everyone today, it's because the regulatory requirements for reviewing medical device research is the same as reviewing a drug study or a study involving a vaccine. So of course with medical device studies you have to make sure risks are minimized, you need to make sure risks are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits. You have to make sure selection of subjects is equitable, and there has to be informed consent. If you look at these first four bullets, what's interesting to note is these do come directly from the regulations, but really they are mirroring those ethical principles we already talked about. It's sort of always been the MO of the FDA and Health Canada to make sure they're capturing those ethical principles by putting them into regulatory requirements. So you do see some overlap there. And then you have your fifth requirement, adequate data monitoring, ensure the safety of subjects. Again, for long-term devices, this is going to be a key. That there, You need to make sure there are adequate privacy and confidentiality protections, and that there are additional safeguards to protect the rights and welfare of vulnerable populations. So again, these are the regulatory requirements, even though they do sound like those ethical principles we discussed. Another thing to consider in the U.S. is with medical device research, again, just like with drug studies or just like with a vaccine study, if there are children involved, the IRB would have to make one of four findings, and so it's important for researchers to be aware of what these are. If you have a medical device study in children, if it's research not involving greater than minimal risk, that's great. It's under category 50.51. It can proceed. If you have research involving greater than minimal risk but presenting the prospect of direct benefit, it's under category 50.52. Then it's also permissible to conduct that research in children. If you have category 50.53, this is where the research involves greater than a minimal risk and no prospect of direct benefit, but is likely to yield generalizable knowledge about the subject's disorder or condition. This category, a couple things to point out. First, if the IRB finds that indeed the research is under this category, you always have to have two parents consent to the child's participation. There are some exceptions, but generally you have to have two parents sign the consent form. The other thing to note is if you actually look at what 5053 says, it talks about research involving greater than minimal risk. Well, if you dig into the regulation, what it actually means is greater than minimal risk here is only a minor increase over minimal risk. So this category is just going to apply to a small subset of research. So it's not just research involving greater than minimal risk, it's really research that is only a minor increase over minimal risk. And finally, you have that fourth category if you're doing medical device research in children, if it doesn't fall into one of the first three categories. So 5054 is sort of a catch-all, but it's a very complicated catch-all because if it is under this category, the IRB cannot approve the research until the FDA commissioner has actually reviewed the research uh, themselves and determined that it is permissible to proceed, or if the FDA says, you know what, IRB, we actually disagree with your finding, we think it's un under one of the other three categories. For 5054, of course, you would also have to have two parents' consent to their child to be in the medical device research. Now, moving into Canada, here I listed the exact same requirement, the regulatory requirements in Canada that also exist in the U.S. So I did that so it's for our ease in referencing to know that really the requirements are the same, but for everyone's information listening in today, I included the citations that would mirror sort of the U.S requirement in the U.S. regulation. So, for example, risks are minimized. I took this from the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2, TCPS 2, Article 11.1 .1 and 11.4. For risks are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits, again, same requirements in the U.S. 
and there I included the citation from Canada. So you get the general idea. In Canada, we can apply those same requirements, the same requirements that are necessary for medical device research as we do in the U.S., but just understand they're not coming from a Health Canada regulation. They're coming from the TCPS2, which again is taken sort of as the most pivotal document in Canada governing research. Now, moving on to unique regulatory considerations, I mentioned a few unique ethical considerations. There, of course, are some unique regulatory considerations dealing with medical devices. One of them is selecting appropriate investigators. As required of all sponsors in the U.S. and in Canada, the IRB must evaluate, this is for all research, drug, vaccine, device, you must evaluate investigators' qualifications. This may include their education, training, expertise, experience. But what makes it different for devices is there's less leeway in who appropriate investigators considered. For example, with a drug study, you could have an internist who may issue, who's used to work with children and may be the principal investigator involved in a trial administering ADHD to children. Based on their experience, they could be an adequate investigator. Well, it's a little bit different with the device. Let's say you have a study involving a hip replacement device. Here, you don't have as much leeway. So, for example, you could say, hey, we just need an orthopedic surgeon to be the clinical investigator. Well, you have to dig down deeper than that. So, is an orthopedic surgeon? That's great. But is it an orthopedic surgeon that actually has experience doing hip replacements? Or is it an orthopedic surgeon that really predominantly works on shoulders and elbows? That's not going to be appropriate. You need someone with that specific skill and knowledge, especially for device trials that involve a surgery. So that's a very unique consideration for medical device trials. Another unique regulatory consideration, and this is just for the US, drug studies, you cannot charge for the product. But for device trials, you can charge for an investigational product. And we specifically know this from the FDA information sheet. I'm not going to read the entire quotation there, but it does state that you can charge for investigational devices, and that cost can come from the manufacturer to the physician that's going to use the device, and that cost, of course, can be passed on to the subject. There are parameters, though. You only can charge what would actually be the cost of the device, so it's sort of at cost. You can't make a profit. A manufacturer or sponsor can't make a profit off a device used in a clinical trial. And if participants in a trial are going to be billed for the device, know that they must be informed. This is a regulatory requirement of informed consent to inform participants about any potential costs. And while the final thing to note is while it is permissible to charge participants for the, just the cost of the device, the IRB could always say, you know, based on the nature of the study, cost of the device, we actually don't think it's appropriate. So if you do want to charge for the device, should also consult the IRB to determine if they think that's going to be permissible. Okay, so we talked about ethical principles, we know our regulatory requirements, now let's move on to what's known as appropriate documentation for the medical device and research. So in addition to making sure in a device trial that all the ethical principles are met, all the regulatory requirements are met, there's going to be the additional sometimes very complicated issue of ensuring there's appropriate documentation for the device. So the FDA regulations, the Department of Health and Human Services regulations, Health Canada regulations, and the Tri-Council Policy Statement 2 do not state that IRBs must review and ensure medical devices in the research trials they review have all appropriate regulatory documentation. So none of these authorities say the IRB actually has to review appropriate documentation for the device. Nonetheless, let me assure you, it is absolutely an IRB function. The reason for this is, first, if an IRB receives documentation about a device, so it receives documentation the device has been approved by Health Canada, or let's say it's been approved by the U.S., this is going to help the IRB kind of determine and assess the device's risk-to-benefit ratio, because if it's already on the market, if an authority with a lot of scientific experience already thinks the device can be approved, that gives some credence to the fact that it's okay to use that device in a clinical trial. The other thing to note is the Association for the Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs that accredits IRBs in the U.S. and Canada actually requires the IRB to review device documentation. This is an element uh, I1.7A, so 
I.7a actually states IRBs are required and must have a policy that discusses how the IRB will ensure appropriate device documentation. And finally, while the regulations in the U.S. and Canada are not explicit about the IRB reviewing device documentation, be assured that the IRB is obligated to ensure documentation by regulatory authorities. A couple examples of how we know. FDA regulation 21 CFR 812.2 actually discusses applicability of the we're going to discuss the IDE regulations, the clinical trials, and specifically mentions IRB. And there was an FDA warning letter issued to Coast IRB, and this warning letter really very clearly spells out that the IRB must ensure appropriate device documentation. So a lot of people have questions why the IRB needs to know about the device or the device's approval or its status. Know that it's not the IRB trying to be difficult, it's that the IRB has to do it. So let's look at that warning letter and how we know very concretely that the IRB must have appropriate device documentation. So I think a lot of people are familiar with what happened with Coast IRB. For, for those that are not, know that Coast IRB and some other IRBs caught the attention of the Government Accountability Office, the Federal Government Accountability Office, because there were certain advertisements that made it seem like maybe IRBs weren't necessarily performing their function or were too focused on profit. So, for example, there was a Coast IRB advertisement that talked about, you know, if you have a study reviewed by us, here's a coupon, you'll coast through your next review, it's free, essentially. This caught the eyes of the Government Accountability Office. So what that office did is it came up with a fictitious IRB submission. And that IRB submission involved a procedure whereby people were having their sort of chest cavity opened up, and there was this adhesive, a surgical adhesive gel that was sort of dumped into the cavity, hopefully helping close up the cavity and, and, and help it. So first of all, the protocol was quite unclear. It was sort of someone came out of nowhere and dumped a bunch of this adhesive gel into a person which seemed risky outright. But what I'm to focus on is, and the reason why Coast IRB got in trouble is because the other two IRBs that had this fictitious protocol said, hey, this is a risky study, we're not going to approve this study, and we need more device documentation. Well, Coast IRB ended up approving the study, and they approved the study without sort of doing its research, and that's what I'm focusing on here in the warning letter. So what the warnings letter is, amongst other things, Coast IRB got in trouble with the FDA and got a warning letter because the FDA said, you did not verify the fact that the device was actually cleared by the FDA and could be marketed, and since this wasn't verified and the device actually wasn't cleared to be used, you should have made sure the device had what's known as investigational device exemption from the FDA or the documentation you need to proceed with using an investigational device. So the FDA said you did not check if it was cleared, you did not make sure it had an investigational device exemption, and you didn't make any appropriate risk determinations. So what this letter is telling us is that Coast IRB in one part failed to do its job because it did not ensure appropriate device documentation, it did not ensure that device had some sort of approval or some sort of investigational device exemption or something else that would permit it to be used in research. So we do know we need appropriate documentation. Now what documentation must we actually receive? So often studies may have more than one device. So if there is more than one device, know that the IRB is going to need to review device documentation for all the devices that are the focus of the research. So as an example, if you have a study comparing the efficacy of two investigational devices, the IRB must have documentation for both devices. If you have a study comparing the efficacy of an investigational device to a currently marketed device, the IRB must have documentation for both devices. And finally, there's a phase three study of an investigational drug for Alzheimer's that utilizes a marketed MRI device to assess the drug's effect on slowing the loss of brain cells associated with the disease. The IRB does not require documentation for the MRI device. This is assuming the MRI device, again, it's marketed, it's being used according to proved indication. Here it's an Alzheimer's drug study, so you don't necessarily need all that documentation for that MRI device. If there's ever a question about what device documentation you have to submit for what devices in the study, contact your IRB and they can tell you what documentation is needed. Now, so we know what appropriate documentation we need for each device. I'm going to run us through these six steps. So these steps work like this. 
First, I like to think in my mind when you have a device trial, and this is assuming there's one device in the trial, first think, is the device a class one device? So a very low risk device and by its very nature, it could be eligible for marketing to the general population. If the IRB knows it's a class one device, then it can be used in the trial. If it's not a class one device, then the next thing to consider, well, then does the device have what's known as a 510K from the FDA, indicating that it's eligible for marketing? Finally, if there's not a 510K, does the device have pre-market approval? In other words, can it be marketed to the general U.S. population? So if it, ha if it is a class one or if it has a 510K or if it has a PMA, then it means it's eligible for marketing to the general U.S. population. And so if the IRB has documentation indicating it's eligible for marketing, and we know that if the FDA thinks it's fine to market this product to the general population, then it would be acceptable also to use these devices in a clinical trial and test it on participants. If it's good enough for the general population, it's good enough for the clinical trial population. Now, step four. So let's say the device is not eligible for marketing. Well then, does it have an investigational device exemption? As in, does the FDA say, okay, we know it's not approved or cleared, but you can use it in a clinical trial? Or if it doesn't have an IDE, then step five. Does the IRB determine and agree that the device is a non-significant risk device, otherwise meaning by the regulations that it's essentially considered to have approved investigational device exemption without having to go through the whole application process? And finally, step six. If it doesn't have an IDE, it's not non-significant risk, is it exempt? Is it a diagnostic device that is exempt? So now I'm going to run us through all six of these steps in more detail and know that I'm going to go through this linearly, but keep in mind that when you're out there reviewing research or submitting research, you can jump to a specific step. So if you know the device you're using in the trial has pre-market approval, then that can be sufficient documentation for that device. You don't have to think about the other steps. Again, we're just going through this linearly so we really understand and have a great concept of all the potential documentation that exists and how to really capture and make sure we have that appropriate documentation for the device. So step one, class one device. Should always consider, is the medical device class one? So a class one device, these are low risk devices. Some examples are prescription sunglasses, you could have elastic bandages, handheld surgical instruments. These devices would, by their nature, since they're class one, could be eligible for marketing. It doesn't mean they're not subject to general requirements from the FDA, like manufacturing requirements or marketing requirements. But for the purposes of reviewing it for a clinical trial, a class one device could be reviewed in a clinical trial without further approval or clearance from the FDA. You have class two devices. These are considered intermediate risk devices. These are blood glucose test systems, arterial catheters, infusion pumps. These are subject to what's known as general controls. Again, manufacturing requirements, marketing requirements, but also special controls. Those special controls are what we're going to get into. Could be something known as a 510K. So it has needs a little bit more oversight from the FDA. And then you have class three devices. These are high risk devices. These could be implantable pacemakers or HIV diagnostic kits. These are subject to your general controls your special controls, and also pre-market approval. So these devices are the ones that are going to need to have all the testing done to determine efficacy and safety. Keep in mind some class two devices, this could also be required to have this pre-market approval, but generally how I've listed it is typically how it goes. Class two could have subject general controls and 510K. Class three is going to have that additional step of the pre-market approval. So what documentation does the IRB actually need to say, hey, we feel comfortable this is a class one device, so we know we don't need any documentation of further for the device in order to know it can be tested in a clinical trial population. So someone that's submitting the application to the IRB can cite the FDA regulation indicating the study device is class one. So the citation there is 21 CFR 862-892. These regulations list out 1,700 essentially uh, different types of devices categorized into different panels. So there could be devices under cardiovascular devices. So you can kind of look up those cardiovascular devices if you're doing a study involving a cardiovascular device and see if, hey, yes, it looks like this device is kind of discussed in the regulations and it would be a class one device. Beyond that, people do have the ability, researchers have the ability to request classification from the FDA for their Device. So if it's unclear what they think the classification of the device is, they can request this from the FDA. And if you have this request for classification, then the FDA has spoken to the device. That's 
perfect documentation for the for the IRB to know, hey, yes, this is a class one device. That's sufficient documentation for us to know it can be tested in the clinical trial population. There's also something known as de novo review. If someone has a device that has a 510K, for example, and they submitted the FDA, but the FDA says, hey, you know, this doesn't really count as a 510K, the FDA may, however, determine the classification of the device, and if it determines that, you know what, this is actually a class one device that may not need IRB review, that sort of de novo documentation provided to the IRB would provide that sufficient documentation for the IRB to know, hey, this is a class one device. And of course, any other documentation that comes from the FDA. The FDA is the final authority on devices, so anything official coming from the FDA would sufficiently tell the IRB and researchers that the device is a class one device. Now moving on to step two. So if the device is not class one, then does the device have what's known as a 510K, or does the medical device have 510K clearance? What a 510K means is the FDA has reviewed an application for a device and has determined that the device is substantially equivalent to a device that's essentially already being marketed, what's known as a predicate device. So most people with device trials try to conduct and get that clearance from the FDA, a 510K, because a 510K is typically much more simple than going to the next step and having to do pre-market approval because you don't have all those different efficacy requirements. You just have to show with a 510K that we have this device that's substantially equivalent to a device that already exists, is already on the market. So the FDA says, yes, we agree with you. It is substantially equivalent to a device already on the market. Then the device is considered cleared. Not approved, but cleared. That's a very important distinction. The FDA doesn't want to say it approved it. It said it cleared it. So what documentation do you need to provide the IRB to show that the device is cleared and is eligible for marketing? Well, typically, it's going to be a 510K clearance letter from the FDA. There's actually a 510K clearance letter, and attached to that letter are typically the indications for use. So if the IRB has that documentation, it can assess that, hey, the FDA says it's 510K cleared. We know the indications for use, and as used in the study, it seems like that device is being used for those approved indications. Therefore, we know it's good enough to be used in the general population, so it can be used in the clinical research population. The 510K number, just for everyone's reference, typically it has a K, and then it'll have six numbers behind it. I've also included the link to the page where you can see, you can actually search out a device and know if it has a 510K and actually find that 510K letter and those indications for use. So because this is a cleared, it's available to the public, there is public record to actually find the clearance online. Now step three. So if it's not a class one, it doesn't have a 510K, does it have pre-market approval? Pre-market approval means the FDA has reviewed a pre-market approval application for the device and has approved the application because through clinical testing and all sorts of data has determined the device is safe and effective. So what documentation do you need to, for the IRB to be assured that the device does have pre-market approval and is eligible for marketing? Here, as with the 510K letter, you could have the PMA approval letter, which also contains the indications for use. The PMA number starts with a P and has six numbers after it. Again, since the device is approved by the FDA, the, that approval is public and it's available online at that link, so you can actually search a device that's being used in a trial and see what its pre-market approval is and what its indications for use are. Again, the IRB is going to have to make sure it knows it has this pre-market approval and it's going to have to assess the protocol to make sure that device as approved is actually being used according to those approved indications. If so, then that's sufficient documentation that the device can be used in the trial. Now moving on to that second part of the linear step line. So if the device isn't class one, doesn't have a 510K, doesn't have a PMA, so it's not eligible for marketing, well it still can be used in a clinical trial, but it's going to require an investigational device exemption. So it's going to require submitting an application to the FDA so that the FDA can say yes, it's permissible for you to use your device in a clinical trial even though we haven't approved it or cleared it. It can be shipped uh, through interstate commerce and that's acceptable. So to approve an IDE, what the FDA is looking at is it's reviewing the research protocol and device information amongst other information to determine if the research as described in the application can proceed. 
So if a device has an IDE, what documentation does the IRB actually have to receive to feel confident that it knows the FDA has issued this IDE? Well, there's the IDE approval letter. This letter is proprietary, so it's not going to be online. It's not available anywhere. The only where that the IRB can receive the letter is from the sponsor itself. So the sponsor will have this letter, and that letter will indicate what the IDE number is for the device. It starts with a G has six numbers after it. Again, you must request this letter from the sponsor. Only with that letter will you know that the device does have an IDE, so it's okay to use that device in the clinical trial. If there is no IDE, then the next thing to consider is, okay, if there's no IDE, is that because the device is a non-significant risk device? So the sponsor is going to be the one that determines at first that the device is non-significant risk but the IRB is specifically required by regulation to make an affirmative finding that indeed it agrees and that as used in the study, the device is a non-significant risk device. Now the key part, it's in italics, it's underlined there, is you make this determination, the IRB makes this determination because of how it's used in the study. So let's say you have a study involving alopecia. You have a hair growth study, there's a device that you put on the top of the scalp that helps hair grow. Well, let's say this trial has that device, okay, just seems like it sits on top of the head, it's not a severe risk, but they've decided that it may be more effective if you take a scalpel, kind of cut away part of the scalp, and actually put the device sort of inside uh, the scalp a little bit. Well, the device on its own may be not a severe risk, but as used in the study, you're actually putting the device, you're making an incision, you're putting the device underneath the skin, well, then the device is going to be a significant risk device. So really consider how the device is actually being used in the trial, not just the device alone. So the assessment that the IRB is always going to make to determine whether or not a device is a non-significant risk device is it's going to look at the definition of what actually is a significant risk device. So that definition is a significant risk device is intended as an implant or is purported or represented to be for use in supporting or sustaining human life, is for a use of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or otherwise preventing impairment of human health, or otherwise presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a subject. So if the IRB can safely say that as used in the study, the device is not an implant, it's not being used to sustain or support human life, it's not of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, or mitigating, and does not present a serious risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a subject, then it can say the device is a non-significant risk device. If the IRB can say this, then this is sufficient documentation because if the IRB finds that a device is non-significant risk, that means it is considered to have an approved IDE application without actually having to have that IDE application. So the documentation for NSR, for the IRB to make that NSR determination, really needs to be from the sponsor or researcher an explanation ex explaining and supporting why the device is indeed not a significant risk device. This information should be supported in the protocol and any supporting documents and the consent form. Of course, if there's an FDA risk assessment that's been requested by the sponsor and received by the sponsor or researcher and that's provided to the IRB, that's fantastic documentation. But again, there needs to be sufficient information provided to the IRB so the IRB can make its NSR determination. And if it has that documentation, makes that determination, then the device can be used in the clinical trial. Now finally, if the device does not have an investigation device exemption and it's not a non-significant risk device, the device may still be considered exempt, as in exempt from the IDE requirements. So a sponsor determines if a device is exempt, and again, the IRB must agree, but it doesn't have to make an affirmative finding like it does with NSR. But what the IRB has to determine is that, yes, we agree with the sponsor that the study does not require an IDE, it's exempt from needing IDE because the study involves a diagnostic device that is non-invasive, does not require an invasive sampling procedure that presents a significant risk, does not by design or intention introduce energy into a subject, and is not used without confirmation of the diagnosis by another medically established diagnostic product or procedure. Often NSR and exempt get confused. It's very important to understand these are two different things. They have two different definitions, and an NSR requires an affirmative finding from the IRB and that affirmative finding means that uh, by that default, it is that study, that device is considered to have an IDE, 
versus exempt. It's a different definition. There's no affirmative finding required from the IRB, but if the IRB finds that indeed it agrees with the sponsor the device is exempt, then it means it is exempt from the IDE requirements. Now the documentation for making sure the IRB can determine the device is exempt, again, an explanation from the sponsor supporting why the device is indeed a diagnostic device as defined in the regulation, which we just looked at that definition on the last slide. And again, information in the protocol and supporting documents must substantiate this assessment that the device is indeed a diagnostic device that is exempt. Okay, so we just went through steps one through six. Again, we went through those linearly because I like to think of them that way to really help make sure I've captured all the documentation requirements that are necessary and to really understand what is the appropriate device documentation. Again, you can jump to any one of those steps based on the device that's used and the documentation that's provided. So that was that linear graphic for the US. Now we're going to switch. We're going to look at the same graphic but modified for medical device research in Canada. So here we can kind of go through the same idea. You have a class one device in Canada. If you have a class one device in Canada, this device can be marketed. If it's class one, it can be marketed to the general population in Canada. Then it means it can be used in a clinical trial population. If a device is not class one, then the device must be licensed by Health Canada. This is essentially approved or cleared as called in the FDA. So if a device is licensed in Canada, that means it's approved by Health Canada, and it means it's eligible for marketing. If we know it's eligible for marketing and it's licensed, then it can be used in a clinical trial. Again, as long as it's being used according to its approved indication. And finally, if the device is not eligible for marketing in Canada, as in it's not class one or it's not licensed, then it can still be used in clinical research, but it must have an investigational testing authorization from Health Canada. This is similar to that IDE from the FDA in the US. So let's look at each of those steps. First, class one. This is going to look very similar to the class system in the US, but there are differences. So a class one, these are low-risk devices. These could be prescription sunglasses, elastic bandages, handheld surgical instruments. These class one devices, why they can be approved and marketed in Canada, there are requirements that they're beholden to. Again, manufacturing requirements as one example. Class two devices, these are intermediate risk devices. These can be contact lenses, arterial catheters, blood reinfusion bags. These are subject to general requirements. These are those manufacturing and marketing requirements and additional requirements. The additional requirements being the medical device license, as in a class two device must be licensed to be marketed in Canada. You have class three devices. These are intermediate risk to high risk devices, orthopedic implants, mammography x-ray systems. These are subject to general requirements and additional requirements, those medical device license requirements. So again, class two, three, and four all require that medical device license from Health Canada. Finally, you have class four. These are your high-risk devices, implantable pacemakers, HIV diagnostic test. So compared to the US, class one in Canada as opposed to the US is about the same. The difference being that class two in the US is broken into a class two and class three in Canada. So really class two and class three are what's that class two in the US and class four would be equivalent to the class three in the United States. So similar, but definitely different because there's four classes in Canada. So if we know the device is a class one device, we know it can be approved to the, and marketed to the general population, what documentation does the IRB have to receive to ensure that it feels comfortable knowing the device is class one, therefore it can be used in a clinical trial. And I think I forgot to clarify when we started talking about Canada, so I'm using the term IRB. Know that the most common term in Canada is our, actually REB, Research Ethics Board, but when I'm talking about Canada and I refer to IRB, just know in Canada the more common term is Research Ethics Board. So the documentation for a class one device that the IRB needs is information supporting that the device isn't in class one by substantiating his class one device by citing the regulations in Canada, SOR 98282, the schedule one indicating that the study device is a class one. So using those rules in Canada to help define what class the device is and showing the IRB, yes, our device is class one because look, it corresponds to these rules that would indicate it is a class one device. 
Of course, if there's other documentation from Health Canada indicating the device is class one, this would be fantastic documentation for the IRB to have to ensure it is indeed a class one device. If it's not a class one device in Canada, then it must be licensed in order to be marketed in Canada. So the next step is determine is the device actually licensed and can be marketed in Canada. Licensed means Health Canada has reviewed a medical device license, MDL, and approved the application. So it's approved the application because it found that the device is safe and effective. Because you have those four classes, which is different to the three classes in the US, it's a little bit different, but I want to compare it to the US process. So the process to actually get a license in Canada for a class two device is similar to the FDA 510K process. The process to get a license in Canada for class three devices is also similar to the FDA 510K process. But for class four devices, that process is similar to the FDA pre-market approval process. So what documentation does the IRB need to show that indeed the device is licensed by Health Canada, can be marketed, and since it can be marketed, we know that it can be used in a clinical trial population. Well, you have the Health Canada medical device license. That license number example, there would be a number and four numbers after it. This is public information in Canada. If Health Canada has approved a device, it's licensed a device, then the, you can search and find these approved devices in Canada, and I've included the link to the web page where you can do that on the Health Canada website. In addition to knowing the device is licensed, again, the IRB is going to have to assess, okay, we know it's licensed, that's great, it can be used in the clinical trial, but that means only if the device is being used in the trial according to its approved indications. So again, it's going to be important for the IRB to assess the device as licensed is actually being used similarly in the clinical trial. Finally, if the device is not eligible for marketing in Canada, as in it's not class one and it's not licensed by Health Canada, it can still be used in a clinical trial, but the documentation that you need to make sure it can be used in a clinical trial population is an ITA, otherwise known as an investigational testing authorization. So Health Canada will issue an investigational testing authorization after Health Canada reviews the research protocol and device information amongst other information and determines that the research as described in the application can proceed. This is similar to the FDA IDE process. The documentation that the IRB is going to require in order to make sure the device has appropriate documentation and so the IRB feels comfortable knowing the device can be used in the clinical trial is that ITA letter. Health Canada actually issues an investigational testing authorization letter. Again, this letter is proprietary, so it's not available online. So in order to receive this letter, it must be requested from the sponsor or the researcher, whoever holds and, and sort of owns that ITA letter. So that was appropriate documentation. I really think that's the most complicated part of this presentation, because with the ethical principles and the regulatory requirements, you're going to be doing the same thing you typically would with drug studies or vaccine studies. Of course, there's some unique considerations, but really where the challenge comes is ensuring there's appropriate device documentation for the device as used in the clinical trial, both in the US and in Canada. But if you stick to those graphics that I just went through, the six steps in the US and the three steps in Canada, you can feel confident knowing that you have the appropriate documentation you need for the device so that the researcher, sponsor are all protected and the IRB is protected to know it's doing its due diligence and that the device can be used in a clinical trial and it can be used with sufficient information also to know that participants are protected. Moving on to part three of the presentation today, we have special considerations. First one, combination products. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, the next special considerations. But what I want to point out with combination products, not going to spend a lot of time, but just know I've talked a lot about appropriate device documentation. Let's say, though, you have a study that involves a drug and a device. It's sort of a, a combination of the two. So a typical example is an injection device for a particular drug. Know that you may not need device documentation if that product, if that combination product is actually considered a drug as opposed to a device or if that combination product is considered a biologic as opposed to a device. 
And how you determine whether or not a combination product is a drug or device is you determine what's known as the product's primary mode of action. So what is the primary mode of action of that product? So I think very clearly with an injection device, if you're injecting a drug, the device is really just a needle. The product is a drug that's meant to treat or at least test for a new treatment of a disease. Really the primary purpose, that primary mode of action is going to be the drug. So in that case, since the primary mode of action is the drug, you don't need device documentation. Instead, you just need that documentation that would be sufficient for a drug study, which in the U.S. is known as the investigation new drug number, and in Canada is known as a no objection letter. Same thing for a biologic in the U.S. If it's not a device that's considered a biologic, you don't need device documentation. What you need is an investigational new drug number, as known as a BBIND, or in Canada, also that no objection letter. So keep combination products in mind when you're thinking about appropriate device documentation. Next, humanitarian use devices. These are devices intended to treat or diagnose diseases or conditions that affect fewer than 4,000 individuals in the U.S. per year. Here, I'm only talking about the U.S. These are interesting. HUDs are essentially devices meant to be used for clinical care, but they don't quite have the efficacy requirements that another device would have that's being marketed to many people that's going through the pre-market approval process. Because it doesn't have as many efficacy requirements, the FDA decided that it wants some additional oversight over these devices. So interestingly, they decided the IRB needs to review and actually approve the use of these HUDs at the specific facility where the device is going to be used. So when reviewing an HUD study, what the IRB has to consider off the bat is if the HUD is being used, is it being used solely for clinical care? Is a doctor simply have this device that is essentially approved for use in a small number of people and is it using it to treat an individual? If this is the case, it's actually not required to have a specific protocol like we're used to seeing for, rece for research and it's not so required to have sort of that research consent form so the IRB can approve it sort of without these typical things but it is still very common for the IRB to approve a consent form and most IRBs still do require a consent form. But it's important for people to understand that this isn't research in the typical sense. So really think about HUDs and what is actually required to be reviewed. Now, if you do have an HUD and it's being used in a setting where it could be provided for clinical care, but there's also research being done with the device, then that sort of exception that you don't necessarily need consent and a protocol goes out the window. Then it's considered just like research, and even though it's an HUD, you need a research protocol and you need to consent people to the study. So it's an important distinction for IRBs and researchers to understand in terms of how the HUD is being used. Is it used only for clinical care or is it being used for research? Next, in vitro diagnostic devices. I'm focusing on only one part of in vitro diagnostic devices here. And what I want to point out with this is that in vitro diagnostic devices maybe used de-identified samples, they're testing assays. So it seems odd to require consent from people to test these in vitro diagnostic devices, especially when they've just provided samples that are de-identified. Well, unfortunately, in vitro diagnostic devices are beholden to the FDA regulations. Since we know this, we know that waiver of consent is not possible. Well, the FDA really realize this kind of puts in vitro diagnostic devices in a difficult place where it really shouldn't seem like consent is necessary, but it's not permitted in the FDA regulations. So what the FDA has actually done is said, we're going to use our enforcement discretion, and if certain criteria are met for an in vitro diagnostic device study, the IRB can still waive consent even though it's an FDA regulated product. That criteria for the IRB determined to know it can waive consent is up there on your screen. So the investigation must meet the IDE exemption criteria, the study must use leftover specimens, the specimens must be uh, not individually identifiable, they must be accompanied by clinical information as long as the information does not make the specimen source identifiable, the individuals caring for the patients are different from and do not share information about the patient, the specimens are provided to investigation without identifiers, and the study has been reviewed by an IRB. So with in vitro diagnostic devices, understand that indeed you can waive consent, but not in a typical sense. You're waiving consent under the FDA's enforcement discretion. 
Now, companion diagnostics. I don't want to confuse these with combination products. They're distinctly different. A companion diagnostic is where there are two products, could be a drug and a device, that are used in conjunction, but they're not considered one product. A common example is an oncology product where you have to assess the dosing of the product by taking the product and actually first testing it in an assay where you take the potential patient's blood and you determine how that product's going to interact to determine dosing level. So in order to safely use the product to understand dosing, you have to have that corresponding diagnostic device, that assay that's going to assess what the dosing level should be. So they have to be used in conjunction, but they are two separate products. Because they are two separate products, know that you have to have appropriate device documentation for the device, and you have to have documentation as well for the drug. So if it's a drug device combination, or sorry, companion diagnostic, you need the IND for the drug, and you may need that appropriate device documentation that we went in through with those six steps in the US. If it's a biologic and a device, you need that BBIND for the biologic, and you need that appropriate device documentation. So remember with companion diagnostics, they're two different products, but it's going to typically be important for the IRB to review them together because it's necessary since they really are in interplay in order to use the product, it's going to be necessary to have the device. And our final special consideration are adaptive trials. These are becoming more common for all trials, but especially with medical device trials. Now, an adaptive trial is a trial that can have preset determinations for if something happens, the design can be changed in the middle of the study without actually needing prior IRB review. The goal of these adaptive trials is to have smaller sample sizes, shorter trial duration, salvage successful portions of a trial. For example, if there's a phase one and a, or there's an ARM1 and an ARM2, let's say the ARM1 fails but the ARM2 is successful, the adaptive trial design can say, hey, okay, we don't need to kill the whole study, we're just going to drop ARM1 and focus ARM R2. And also the hope with adaptive trials is increased efficiency because you're moving more in real time, adapting to the trial and the results. Keep in mind, adaptive trials do not permit ad hoc changes. These are not ad hoc changes. They are changes that are planned based on a determination of the initial protocol that has specific statistical parameters put in place. So that brings up the other issue. If an IRB is going to be reviewing these adaptive trials, it may have to really think about having someone with experience with adaptive trials or with the statistics like a statistician in order to understand the protocol and really understand if its parameters for changing the protocol and when they're going to be changed seem appropriate. But it's going to be important to not shy away from handling these adaptive clinical trials, which IRBs are not used to seeing, and it feels uncomfortable to permit a trial just to change without reviewing a protocol amendment, but they're going to be important for the future. And it's important, especially for uh, companies like Medtronic and GE Healthcare that have large systems like MRIs and CT scans that have a lot of software. Software has to be tweaked and changed constantly, and it really affects the trial if you have to go back to the IRB for review each time there's a small tweak made. So adaptive clinical trials can be really important for those types of studies. Now, to sum all this up, we went through three major parts today. The first one, know the authorities in place governing medical device research in the U.S. and Canada. The reason why I say this, if you know the authorities, if you know the regulations, if you know the guidelines, that empowers you to answer your own questions that come up surrounding medical devices and helps you move through things more efficiently. In terms of reviewing medical device research, think about applying the ethical principles. There's beneficence, respect for persons, and justice. Ensure compliance with the regulatory requirements that are the same for device trials as they are for drug or vaccine studies and make sure to obtain appropriate documentation for the medical devices that are the focus of the research. Finally, for part three, consider those unique issues that arise with combination products, with humanitarian use devices, in vitro diagnostics, remember that waiver of consent provision, with companion diagnostics, and with adaptive trials. Keeping all these things in mind helps you conceptualize for yourself how to actually review medical device research in the Canada and the US, and hopefully can help you efficiently put forward that research that can really benefit a number of populations with new and innovative medical devices. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Ari, who has some closing remarks.
Thank you, Mitchell, for preparing and presenting the information on this really uh, relevant topic. I wanted to remind everyone that the recording, the slide deck, at the certificate of attendance will be accessible within five business days. We will be posting them up to the website, and we will be emailing you a link as soon as they're available. I'm going to plug the survey one more time, so we do value your opinion, so don't close your browser down. Once the webinar completes, the, the survey will pop up, and it's just a few questions that really helps us guide what we do next. And once again, we here at Quorum Review would really like to thank you for attending our webinar, and we hope you found this topic informative and useful.